Mining the Word, staying true to Scripture while applying it to my everyday life. What do a ping pong ball in Daniel chapter 6 have in common? Welcome to Mining the Word, and we'll jump right into it, and at the end of this short message, we'll take a look at the real meaning of the ping pong ball. By the way, did you notice anything missing last week, or in the previous segment, Daniel chapter 5? Yes, that's right. We didn't have the fire on. And no, it wasn't by design. These things happen. But let's pause briefly for a word of prayer. Lord God, thank you so much for being there for Daniel in his time of crisis. Thank you for being by us in our times of crisis too. Please guide as we look at how he was able to do this and how to apply that to our own lives, especially one key point. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Come with me in your Bible to Daniel chapter 6, and we look at the beginning of it in verse 1, where it describes how the king that came in, this brand new king, Darius, or Darius if you prefer, set up his kingdom so it had 120 satraps scattered around the land, and then there were above these three, and he was thinking, maybe I'm going to make Daniel the top over all of these. And as you can imagine, that caused some negative conversation amongst these leaders. Because one thing is certain in politics, each individual wants to somehow rise to the top, thinking that the cream rises. Now there's an old Japanese saying that something like this, the nail that stands up gets hammered down. And as they looked and saw Daniel apparently being brought up, they decided they're going to hammer him down. And so we see in the verses which follow that they're trying desperately to figure out what is it that he's doing wrong. Let's jump into the story in verse 3. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. There it is, an excellent spirit. He wasn't like everybody else. They could sense the difference, and you would think that would attract people to him, and in fact it did attract the king to Daniel. But all these others that were vying for power, they couldn't afford to cut him some slack. We jump into verse 4. So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful nor was there any error or fault found in him. That is fascinating. I mean, to think that a political leader could be so clean that his enemies would look and search and try to find something wrong with him and they couldn't find anything. It's not common to find this in political leaders of our day or of any land. We find as we dig in a little bit deeper, verse five, they got an idea Then these men said, these men. It wasn't all 120, even though they're going to try to make it sound like it. It's some very specific ones that have been trying to drag him down. I've heard it said that a bucket of crabs never needs to have a lid on it because if one crab starts crawling up, the others will drag it back down. And these people, as they would see someone seeming to rise, they would try to drag him down. Instead of trying to be better men themselves, they thought, if I can only put him down, I will look better. And that's something that unfortunately happens in schools and offices, in work situations that are different out in the field or roofing or wherever you are. Sometimes people seek to pull down the guy that's above them in order to make themselves look more wonderful. But we go back to verse 5. Then these men said, We shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. There it is. This is not new in history. We find that again and again through the course of history, when people can't find something wrong, they'll sometimes go to your faith and say, we will make your good actions become illegal. Then we can get you. If it's something that's part of your faith, we know you will keep doing it. Well, they watched Daniel, and they realized it wouldn't be hard to find one specific thing that could drag him down. And so you remember the story as they crafted a plan to make it illegal to pray to anyone except the king. And they came in with persuasive words saying, oh, you know, 
we want to serve you and don't let anyone pray to anyone else for 30 days except you. And if he does, he'll be thrown to the lions. They knew this was going to be a sure cure for their problem as a night with the lions would be the end of this person. Verse 10. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home. And in his upper room, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since early days. Wow. Several things come to mind. First, this was his custom. Here's the busiest man in all of Babylon, except for the king. He's probably one of the busiest guys. But he was able to pause three times a day and enter the presence of God and to communicate with him. At the end, we're going to look at a little bit of how that was possible for Daniel. But the second thing that I notice with this is that he would kneel down and pray and give thanks, but this praying is in a certain direction. He actually would pray, as you see the verses that follow, he would point his face toward Jerusalem where there used to be a temple. And this was remembering the prayer of Solomon way back in 1 Kings chapter 8, as Solomon noted, we will pray. If we sin, we'll come back and pray here at this temple. And when we sin to the point where we are taken off into captivity from those lands, we'll point our faces back toward where the temple was and we'll approach you in prayer. And we notice when Jesus was on earth, he would do something like this, but instead of the temple on earth, he'd pray with his face toward heaven, praying toward the Father in heaven. And now, as we know from Hebrews 4, verse 14, we don't have an earthly temple anymore. The temple's in heaven, and Jesus Christ is there at the right hand of the Father. So we lift our hearts toward heaven in prayer, as Daniel used to point his face toward Jerusalem. It reminds me of when I had a Muslim roommate, not roommate, sorry, class schoolmate at Andrews University, and he asked me one day, which way is north? So I can figure out, I've got this chart that tells me which way is Mecca. And if I know which way north is, then I can calculate how many degrees to the side and I can point my face toward Mecca. So I took him outside and showed him, look, this sidewalk is exactly north and south. I tested it by looking at the North Star. And he thanked me and moved his prayer mat so he'd be facing directly where he believed he should face, just like Daniel would do each day. Anyway, we see in the verses which follow, the people found they finally had trapped Daniel. They went to the king. They had seen Daniel praying and making his supplication. And they say to the king, that Daniel, verse 13, that Daniel, who's one of the captives from Judah, does not show due regard for you, O king, etc. They mentioned how he made petitions before another god. You notice the disdain in their voice, and maybe they tried to hide it. That's almost like smiling. Oh, we're so sorry. We've got somebody that's disobeying you. And it reminds me of once when I saw on a certain Christian broadcasting uh, display, they, they were talking about, oh, we're so sad. We found this certain apostasy in the church. And you could see their faces were all excited. We've got the scoop on these people that are not following you. Sometimes our words and our faces disagree with each other. And I'm sure that King Darius or Darius could look right through them and recognize, you guys aren't genuine. You are eager to get rid of him. And he could see the disdain as it's that Daniel, one of the captives. But there's nothing he could do. He tried to see if he could save his friend. But the law was carefully written, and it could not be changed. The laws of the Medes and Persians were not alterable. And so, verse 14, I noticed the key expression, the king was greatly displeased with himself. He wasn't just upset. He actually was higher in his moral standards than a lot of people we interact with today. He didn't just point at everybody else, it's your fault, your fault. He's displeased with himself. He recognized, I had a role to play. And that begins a process of hope. Because when you first recognize I have something to do with this problem, then there's a chance to make a better outcome. Much as Stephen Covey mentioned in his book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, as he noticed, the thing we have to begin with is be proactive. Recognize there's something I can do. And indeed, the king recognized there's something I have done that made the problem. Well, 
as Daniel had to be put in the lion's den, verse 16 ends with the king speaking, saying to Daniel, your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. Wow. At Daniel's moment of crisis, he had the words of the king himself. Your God will deliver you. Sometimes you may be surprised where the encouragement comes from. It may be coming from people that don't even pretend to serve the Lord. But as you face a moment of crisis, some small encouraging word can come from them that reconnects you with the reality. God is in control. And he's even giving me this message through a surprising source coming from an unbeliever. Well, as we continue looking, the place is sealed. That reminds us of Jesus. Jesus' tomb was sealed because the priests couldn't trust the disciples and the disciples couldn't trust the priests. It's like, is somebody going to snitch him or make a message that this or that happened? And here the king and the, the other leaders, the satraps who were against Daniel, they couldn't trust each other. So it's sealed to prove nobody's messing around here. He's really in with the lions tonight. Verse 18 follows with the king fasting and not accepting musical entertainment or anything. He just tosses and turns through the night, and I wonder what's happening in that lion's den. Would it be like Acts 12, where Peter could peacefully sleep knowing he would be killed the next day or God would protect him? Or was it more like Exodus 17, where Joshua is fighting down below and Moses lifts his hands in prayer as Israel moves forward, or as his hands get tired and he lowers them, Israel is defeated before the Amalekites, and back and forth it goes. Is Daniel praying and the lions back off? And maybe rather, it's more like Peter, and he just lay down and slept, and God took care of him. We don't know. It doesn't tell. But it does tell that in the morning, verse 20, the king came back and the end of the verse, he said, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? And notice Daniel's words. He wouldn't use these words for Nebuchadnezzar. He wouldn't use these words for Belshazzar, but he used them for Darius. He said, verse 21, O king, live forever. Verse 22, my God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. And then the king joyously had Daniel brought out from there and he threw in the ones that accused Daniel and their families. I know that's ugly, but that's the way they did in this pagan kingdom. It's not something God asked them to do. But you notice as it said here that Daniel recognized God gave me the protection, and he witnessed about that reality. He maybe even saw the angel that helped him. I don't know, but he recognized God sent deliverance. It was, in a way, easier for the three friends who faced the flames as they could see each other and be strong. Shadrach, be strong. Meshach, yes, you can do this. We'll stand true to the Lord. But Daniel stood alone. Those young men faced the risky test. And now Daniel, at least 84 years old, is facing the risky test. And in each case, God was there. He put his hand over the crisis and saved his people. But in each case, they were ready to say, even if he doesn't save us, we stand for him. And so we come down to the end where we see the testimony of King Darius in verse 25 and following as he praises the true God and recognizes your God is powerful. Where does this take us? I'll never forget when Paul Hawks, the academic dean at Weimar College, shared something like this with us in 1987. He brought in some jars. Now I'm just using these little plastic peanut butter jars that we've got in Korea. But you see how there's one that is with beans. There's one that's empty. And the empty one represents a full day, 24 hours. Now we're showing how there are lots of little things that can go into that day. Things that are not worth a hill of beans, but it could be like Instagram or email or brushing our teeth. Lots of little bits and pieces that come in. And the ping pong balls, they represent things that are more significant. That might be like exercise or time at the office or maybe sleep. 
and we see how we try to put the important things in, but there isn't room for everything. In fact, there are three of those big significant things that didn't even fit. And we came to the end of one day with all the little stuff that crowded in, but the few of these big things just didn't make it. But we don't have to live our day that way. Much like Stephen Covey would write in his book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and as Paul Hawkes, the academic dean, would share with us that day, we can do things a very different way. Now, we're going to use the other jar to represent a brand new 24-hour period that we're going to live a very different way. This time, we're going to plan first the most significant things. And one of those could be exercise or time with God, time with family, sleep, the study for exams if you're a student or work. It varies from person to person what those big ones are. And now I'll go back to my ghetto funnel and see if we can still get some of these small things in. You know, we still have time to do a bit of email, take a shower, brush our teeth, and so forth. Whoops, there wasn't time for Instagram. That's on the side, or was there? Maybe we could even squeeze the one more thing in if we just pat this down. In fact, yes, we can sneak that one in too, and the lid still comes on. It's interesting how if you plan the big things where they go in your day, the little things can squeeze in, otherwise they fill up the whole day. That doesn't mean you do the big things first, but it can mean that, or should mean that first you plan where they, will they happen. So like Daniel, you'll have time for what's most important. And so I challenge you to do as Daniel did in Daniel chapter 6, the busiest man busiest man in the realm, had no time for prayer and Bible study, and yet he made time to spend in God's presence three times every day, praying, facing the place of worship. A special time, a special place. He was busy, but he could do this because he chose to make it like one of the ping pong balls in his life. It was a priority, and so it happened. It's not that it necessarily happened first thing. No, it happened first and middle and last thing in his day. And I challenge you to do likewise. Daniel could be strong because of the constant, persistent, everyday time in the presence of God. And then it was no surprise or no great big heroic action at the end. He was strong because he spent time with God. I challenge you to do likewise. But let's pause briefly and pray. Lord God, thank you so much for the presence. Thank you for being with Daniel to help him be true. Help us be true, not only in times of crisis, but in the moments of decision when we choose you or choose the next thing on our checklist. Thank you for your counsel in that area. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you again for your time, and I hope to have you join us again next time in Mining the Word. God bless you as you carefully plan each day, where are my priorities, where will they happen in my day?